Okay, everybody. So welcome. We're going to talk about soil and the things living in it today, which is fascinating. We're doing amazing research on this sort of thing right now. Uh, just all sorts of nifty things are coming to light. So let's get to it. Um, what lives in the soil is more important to me at any rate, um, and probably to us, than the soil itself. Uh, we have things like the mycorrhizal fungi and the soil food web. Um, how how do we support all of this? Mother Nature, she's been doing it for a while. So uh, I always chuckle uh, at people bagging up their leaves. And if you are there, I apologize. Um, but we're coming, you know, there are election cycles come and go. And, and you're never going to hear people saying, I want to pay more taxes. If we pile all this stuff out by the road, and then the city comes along and takes it away, that costs a lot of money. So if we teach people alone, just forget the right thing to do for the environment. If we teach people to uh, recycle what falls on the property onto the property, then that's going to save us a boatload of money. Um, so, I mean, we used to burn the leaves, right? And, and then we realized that was bad. So then we go through this fiddly process of bagging them up. A big diesel engine comes and takes them away. And then a bunch of diesel engines turn them and mulch them and make them into compost. And then if you're really on the ball as a gardener, you take your car and you line your trunk with plastic and you go on compost day and you pick up the compost. And that's great. It's good that people do the picking up part. Um, but like, that's a lot of carbon. I don't know if that's better than when we were just burning the leaves. So if you mulch the leaves right into the grass, for instance, um, that kickstarts the whole soil microbiome. Uh, it makes uh, more nutrients available for the grass. It actually releases phosphorus. All kinds of good things happen when we do that. And it's easier. And easier is my favorite. Uh, I'm a big fan of easier. So um, there we go. Come on. Oh, no. OK. So some of the con uh, concepts that we're going to talk about mulching, composting, letting it lie, uh, minimum tillage. These are all, well, let's be honest, they're very old concepts that are coming back into vogue, uh, but they do a lot of good for the soil. Biodynamic accumulators is kind of a nifty concept. The idea is that there are plants that reach deep into the soil and pull up the micronutrients that get depleted on the surface. When we cut and take it away, we're taking away those micronutrients. Plants like switchgrass, uh, they reach deep into the soil, pull things up. And as we recycle them on the surface, we replenish those micronutrients, things like calcium and molybdenum, which is just fun to say. Um, we're getting back to the idea of composting again. And there are easy ways, hard ways. There's all sorts of different ways. If you just pile it, that's called cold composting. And that's great. But it doesn't really heat up or kill pathogens or weed seeds. Uh, if you do three bin composting, then uh, you, so behind this little screen here, we have uh, a bin. We have another one here, another one there. Uh, made of hardware cloth, which is sort of a, a wire mesh that's galvanized. Uh, you fill the first bin. When it's full, you take a fork, you open up a little door here, take a fork and turn it into the second bin. You fill the first one again. When it's full, you turn the second one into the third one, the first one into the second one, and you fill the first one again. When this is full, the third one's ready to go onto your garden. And then you turn leather, rinse, repeat. Uh, this is a, uh, there are all sorts of different rolling composters. Um, and uh, this is where I put all my veggies, uh, the things that might attract critters to your yard, because you don't want to do that. Um, so once it doesn't look like anything would want to eat it, <laughs> then I empty it and put it onto the middle compost bin. And that just becomes part of the rotation. Um, I will often actually put this one near the kitchen. Uh, and then this one a little further away just for aesthetics and I'll plant shrubs to hide it. <laughs> Stealing my neighbor's leaves gets me some weird looks, but I uh, I mulch them into my garden. I'll use them. I'll, I'll put them on the little strip of grass and, and run over the mower and, and bag them. And then I put them on my roses and my tender shrubs and so on. And, uh, and in the spring, I spread those around. Uh, I also spread them through the entire garden. Um, uh, so I... I will often just take that good, rich compost and I'll mulch it. I'll, I'll spread that in the garden. I'll look for the areas that the soil looks thirsty. Uh, 
where the soil is looking a little dry and cracked at the heat of summer, I, I'm sort of always keeping a bit of an eye out for that. And that's where I'll put the compost. I even put my shreddables in there. Um, anything that I can compost, I compost. Uh, even even pizza boxes. Um, so uh, hopefully we can make this uh, a PDF of this presentation available. If folks want to reach out uh, to me, we'll uh, give my email address at the end, and then I can send them a PDF. And that's just a clickable link about composting. Uh, we've spent so much time fighting nature, trying to tell nature what to do. And nobody reaches out to me saying, I want to do more work. Everybody, no, nobody says I'm, I'm looking for something sort of Palace of Versailles. No, everybody's looking for the simplest low maintenance landscape that they can find. Um, uh, what we're going to talk about today is going to increase insect and bird life, uh, arthropods, insects and spiders and all that jazz. Many pollinators are great predators. Um, if you're supporting biodiversity, all of the potential life that you could have in your garden, then you're going to have uh, a, healthier, a happier, healthier garden that is lower maintenance because nature is going to take care of most of the problems. And that's a good thing. And, and you're supporting many things that we want to support, like the bees and the monarchs and everything that goes with them. Um, Fungi, even before things fall, fungi start breaking stuff down. Fungi are actually really cool. The more I learn about them, the more fascinating they are. Um, and, and there are all kinds of different kinds. But by the way, this stuff, I get so many calls. You can see it here too. How do I kill it? What is it? First of all, let's flip that around. Let's find out what it is before we figure out what to do about it. These are lichens and lichens are a combination, an amalgam of maybe up to four different species of fungi and an alga uh, or L, one of the species of algae. And uh, uh, sometimes they even have a bacteria mixed in um, and they're, they're very pollution sensitive. So a lot of people got their shorts in and out about the uh, drive clean program. We're seeing more lichens now on trees than we did 10, 15 years ago. And that's because we've actually cleaned up the air a fair bit. Lichens are very pollution sensitive. But these guys here are little puffballs and they're a type of fungi uh, or fungus and they break down organic matter. They're really good at breaking down lignans and things that other uh, creatures can't. When I was at the Niagara Park School, if there was a fungus, you killed it. Life was easy, but it wasn't necessarily good for the environment. Um, now we're starting to realize the value of these fungi in the soil. Mycorrhizal fungi, uh, have threads, hyphae, that insinuate themselves into the plant roots and then triple the water uptake capacity of the plant. That's a broad brush statement. It's all over the place what they do. Um, but they also allow plants to communicate between species, which is phenomenal, and share nutrients between species. They take sugar from the plant that they're working with, but in exchange, they do a lot for that plant, which is really cool. Um, if, if Bob the walnut gets gypsy moth, um, or LDD, uh, which is Lymantria dispar dispar. If anybody's wondering, we've stopped trying to stop calling it gypsy moth. Um, if it gets LDD, it's going to send a message through the mycorrhiza to tell the other trees, even other species, hey, fill the maple. I've got LDD. So you might want to change your chemical composition. And the other plants change their chemical composition to be less appealing. To the caterpillar, which is phenomenal. Nature's got this. Um, I really want to launch into spraying forests. Now that's not great, but let's focus, Sean. Um, so these little white threads that you can see here, these are the hyphae. Hyphae are basically fungus roots. They're bundles of mycelium, which are single-celled fungal roots, and they all group together. Uh, and you can see how fluffy they are. They're reaching out into the soil to gather moisture and nutrients, which is really nifty. Um, some things, walnut uses the fungal network in reverse to send juglone out into plants. Although it's not as big a deal, walnuts don't really kill the plants around them. They just feed heavily and uh, draw a lot of water. There are actually plants. This is a really cool plant. My very first memory was when I was four. How geeky am I? And I dragged my dad out in the woods in Coldwater, Ontario, and uh, I, he helped me identify ghost pipe. And ghost pipe is a plant. So you got the pine tree, you've got the fungus feeding and helping the pine tree. And then way over there, you've got ghost pipe. And ghost pipe is stealing sugar and nutrients from the fungus. Uh, which is quite fascinating. Uh, the way nature works is amazing. And this is an orchid that does the same thing. Um, when, this kind of boggles my mind, um, a plant can, 
uh, we figured taste the spit of the insect that's feeding on it. And then the plant will release pheromones into the air that if it's aphids, they tell ladybugs, hey guys, there's food here. If it's caterpillars, they release a different fragrance into the air and tell birds, hey guys, there's food here. So the birds come and eat the caterpillars. It's absolutely incredible how nature works and, and how they communicate with each other. And then there's the whole business of uh, the, the trees uptaking water helped by the fungus that helps create the whole hydrological cycle of, of mist going into the air and cooling the air and then eventually becoming rain again. Um, so this is all really important stuff. Now, there, there are people that might argue with me about soil not being alive. Uh, soil is an amalgam in, in my mind of the hard stuff that used to be rock that makes soil and all of the things that live in it because soil is not really of any great use to us if it doesn't have all the living things in it so to categorize it in your mind as a living thing is probably beneficial if if i took all the things out of you that weren't human you wouldn't be very healthy for very long um uh, it's only three percent of your body mass but there's more cells in you that aren't human than that are and they help us live um so when we're piling soil if we make great big piles the center deoxygenates and we kill all the things that are living in the soil. So generally speaking, you want to make little piles of soil. It's far healthier. It keeps the soil microbiome, all the things that live in the soil alive. Um, we, we mix things like biochar, which is uh, carefully prepared charcoal. We mix that with the soil and that gives biosurface uh, something for creatures to live on in the soil and then they radiate out from there and bacteria nibble on the roots of the plants and fungi release acids that dissolve or not the plants uh bacteria nibble on the rocks and release nutrients and fungi release uh acids from the roots that dissolve the rocks releasing nutrients uh, all together when we make healthy soil by adding organic matter by adding biochar um, we make a soil that's going to provide nutrients uh, to the plants. When we mix uh, biochar with it, we call that terra preta. And uh, there's actually archaeologists that discovered that in the Amazon. And if you've got biochar in the soil, you actually can't deplete the soil. It's incredible. You can farm it forever and ever. We look at the way soil is created. We've got topsoil on the surface. We've got subsoil underneath. In this particular instance, we've got a sand band that used to be old shore of Lake Iroquois running underneath that. Soil is created in layers. Really, it's only this top stuff that's of, of great use to us. This is hard for plants to get through, hard for plants to get nutrients from. This is where all the life is up in this top level here. Uh, here you see it again, this dark stuff that's got a lot of organic matter. It's got a lot of life in it. Um, uh, we did a rain garden once up in Stouffville and uh, it wasn't draining. And I know that Stouffville is glacial till. It should have drained well. There's actually a hard pan. There was a layer down here where the farmers back in the day would disc to and all the fines would accumulate there and it became an impervious surface. So we had to actually bash down through the hard pan uh, into the subsoil, into the gravel beneath to help the rain garden drain properly with an auger. Um, it was quite the, quite the process, but uh, the way that the soil is is made affects how deep the roots can go, how much oxygen is in the soil, and how much of the soil microbi microbiome can live there. Um, so hard pans are, are quite fascinating, and the whole microbiome itself is quite fascinating. Uh, if you haven't read Hidden Life of Trees yet, I, I highly recommend that, and a, another book called Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake. Um, according to uh, Peter Wolben, 60% of the things that live above the water have to live in rotting wood for part of their life. So we over clean, generally speaking. I now put a log in my landscapes to create biodiversity. I will have to remember to tell my assistant to do that on the design that he's working on now. Um, and they could be ornamental, like they, they moss up, the things grow on them that don't grow uh, elsewhere and lots of cool creatures live in them. Um, we're working on encouraging pollinators, uh, life above and below the soil is all very important to us. Um, we know that, uh, you know, 25 to 50% of pollination is done by non-bee insects. Every creature is important to us. Um, when we look at the soil, um, I, I, when I was preparing this, I went, you know, picking up logs and boards and stuff and looking for good pictures. And I was really happy with this one because of all the life that's right here. Um, crickets 
crickets are mulchers. Crickets take leaves and make them into stuff that bacteria can break down and uh, fungi can break down. Of course, earthworms, interesting point. Earthworms are not native here. Uh, they were pushed back by the glaciers and they did not return on their own. It was the pioneers who brought them back. Now we have something absolutely terrifying. Um, when you're done here today, go look up jumping worms. We have to be very careful about moving soil around from now on because there's a new type of worm that can mess up our forests really, really bad and the biodiversity in them. Um, not everything is good that lives in the soil. This is a click beetle larva and they generally eat plant roots. They can become problematic. Um, this little guy here, potato bug, sow bug, pill bug, whatever you want to call them, isopod if you want to get technical, they're mulchers also. They take uh, plant matter and, and make it into little pieces that bacteria and such can break down. Um, they're super cool. I, I love the fact that they're the only land crustacean. They're the only crustacean that lives above land all the time. They don't have a water phase of life. They actually have gills under here, which is why you'll see them in, in moist soil and so on. Um, but they do a lot for us, actually. There are very few bad things. When things get out of control, like flick beetle or wireworm larva, then that can become a problem. But generally speaking, if you have good soil biodiversity, then everything keeps everything else in check. If you have good soil biodiversity, you have a certain number of uh, nematodes in the soil. They will keep the click beetle population under wraps, even crickets. Anything that lives in the soil, nematodes will, um, the beneficial predatory nematodes will keep that under control. Um, Sure, crickets can eat plants, but they don't do a whole lot of damage. Generally, they're good mulchers. Um, we know a lot about worms. Um, they're great for gardens. They're great for veggie gardens. They're not great for our forests, but I think that ship has sailed. Uh, just like I said, look up jumping worms. The Master Gardeners of Ontario Facebook page has a really good article on jumping worms that you can look into in a video. Uh -huh. um, even these guys here. So these are millipedes and these are centipedes. These are bad because they eat plant material. These are good because they eat their carnivores. These guys don't reach populations that get out of control. Generally speaking, they don't do a lot of harm. They're just, again, mulchers. I'd love to start a hashtag, careful what you squish, because most people's reaction is to stomp on stuff like this, but they do a lot of good for us. And a lot of people would mistake these guys and these guys for each other. These guys are amazing predators uh, that kill all sorts of uh, insects in the soil. This is a native cockroach. And I people will go, ew, this guy's harmless. All he is is a mulcher. There are even even the lowly cockroach. There are good cockroaches, uh, cockroaches that do us benefit. Um, what are these little pearls? Why, those are stale eggs. Uh, we, I love listening to radio call-in shows because every week someone's grumbling about snails and slugs. I just don't overclean, so I have a place for good creatures to live. Um, and they eat the snail eggs and the slug eggs and keep the population below a threshold. This is one of the many types of ground beetles we have, super fast moving, very beautiful actually when you look at them close up, iridescent and metallic, and they eat snail and slug eggs as do rove beetles. Um, there are bad bacteria and viruses in the soil like tetanus, um, for instance, but there are more good than bad. The more diversity you have, the less the bad things are going to get out of control. But these guys do stuff for us as well. These guys are going to keep pests under control. If the pest population goes up, the whatever feeds on them and makes them sick goes up, and then the pest population comes down. And it's always doing this in the soil, which is important to remember. Um, get your tetanus shot. Um, it's important. We can get diseases from soil. Don't panic. Just really use your head. Um, wash your hands, get your tetanus shot, that sort of jazz. Um, all of the things that we're looking at also serve to aerate the soil. They're busy moving through the soil, mulching as they go, and making little holes in the soil through which water can infiltrate and through which organic matter is drawn in, which becomes a sponge, which helps keep water. This is my, uh, my old garden, actually. And uh, you can see how rich the soil is there. They say it takes 100 years to make an inch of soil. I'm not sure who they are, but I, I know that we, our soil level went up about eight inches in the 18 years, excuse me, goodness, that I was there. Um, it, it made overall, it made the, uh, the the soil much healthier, easier to weed. Water would soak in real quick, uh, which also stop, uh, helps prevent runoff, which back to the rain garden thing, 
big fan of rain gardens. Um, eliminating turf lowers maintenance in the long run, uh, saves water, increases infiltration. Turf does more good than hard surfaces, but gardens do more good than turf. Um, if we don't look after the soil, we've only got so much, and, and you can lose a lot fast uh, if you're leaving it bare, uh, not mulching, not reincorporating organic matter. Um, cleaning up the garden in the fall means a lot of your organic matter is going to blow away. Um, there are we, we can do terrible damage to the soil very, very quickly uh, with compaction, with cultivation, and with salts, so the compaction cultivation and the cation exchange conundrum. Um, uh, so one of the reasons that we want to soak in soil is to protect our rivers. Uh, you get less runoff, you get less erosion, you get less sediment when we're mulching and when we're stewarding soil. So that's a good thing. Uh, erosion control is going to prevent that sediment. Um, Erosion control, there are all sorts of fancy systems that you can uh, ascribe to, to reduce erosion. Really just looking after the soil, um, incorporating organic matter and planting heavily is, is going to do a lot. Uh, there are fancy systems that you can get. Now, I, I'm, I'm hoping that I can make this uh, PDF available to you afterwards, but uh, I'm going to kind of skim through this. There are all sorts of things that you can do to prevent erosion, especially on a new construction site. So if you're clearing areas, please do things like uh, putting down uh, erosion socks um, and uh, and even um, mats to prevent um, sediment. Um, there are sediment fences that you can put up uh, if you're going to be clearing large areas, uh, rock check dams with riprap to slow the water and, and help infiltrate it and even protecting our stormwater drains because we can do terrible damage really quickly to local waterways. They're, we're trying really hard to restore fish habitat. You have runoff from a site, it silts up the pebbles in the creek and now the fish don't have anywhere to breed. Um, you can even look up the erosion and sediment control guidelines um, and if you are interested in that sort of thing, sort of take it to the next level. Um, and this all ties into rain gardens and LID as well. Um, it's not, one of the things that's interesting is we're always looking for one big solution. Instead, we should be looking for many little solutions. Uh, every little thing that you can do to help the soil, to help uh, keep water on your property, um, to help control erosion um, and, and protect biodiversity in the downstream life that's there, keeping the vegetation uh, alive. Some people like their gardens perfectly clean all the time, even in winter, that causes erosion, that gets into the storm drains, and where does it go? It goes to the local stormwater pond, and, and from there it goes into the creeks. Maybe sometimes it goes directly into the creeks. Minimizing how much we work the soil, we're trying to get people to cultivate less. Minimum tillage is very important, and that all helps water soak into the ground. Um, so these, these are all different steps that you can take uh, to prevent soil erosion. Um, like I said, we'll try and make this available to people after the fact. Soil with good porosity, um, so little holes that run through it isn't just good for the plants, cleans the stormwater. Uh, and I truly believe that if we're going to look at any solution, growing your own food, most popular trend in, in horticulture right now, it's been growing for years, um, growing native plants, growing pollinator plants and so on. It doesn't have to look like a solution. It should look beautiful, no matter what. And if people, by the way, don't like your garden, tough. It's your garden. It doesn't matter if they like it or not. I had people, my gardening style is English cottage on steroids, and there are people who vehemently hate my garden. And that's okay, because there are other people who love it. And more importantly, I love it. Um, so when we're making it pretty, we're talking, the first step is texture. Everybody thinks about plants, uh, flowers. You should be looking at a mix of sword-shaped, feathery, and bold. That is just automatically going to be beautiful. Um, and match the soil match the plants to the soil. Every year I get a call, we'd like you to come in and strip out a foot of clay and put in good soil. Uh, I love the concept of cognitive dissonance. You can't argue with what people think they know, but you can ask them questions and maybe give them a little extra information. As long as they don't think they're being told what to do, they're open to that. So people call me and I say, oh yeah, sure, we can do that. It's expensive. And they're, oh, is there anything else we can do? Sure, yeah, we could plant plants that like clay. Oh, there aren't plants that like clay. My mother was not a gardener. 
but she taught me roses love clay. Wisteria loves clay. You look at this picture. This is in uh, Oakville, Ontario, and there are plants here, <laughs> uh, beautiful, beautiful plants that thrive in clay. So there used to be brickyards in this neighborhood. There's still one in Burlington. Um, echinacea, chrysanthemums, hostas, a little overused to say the least. Uh, this yellow thingy over here is potentilla. Sedums are great. Grasses are great. Pretty much any um, prairie plant is is clay tolerant. Um, trees, there's tons of trees that are clay tolerant. Uh, if you go outside, I mean, Southern Ontario is clay rich, shall we say. And yet maples do well, honey locusts do well, um, pines and spruce do well. There's all kinds of trees that do well in clay soil. Just look out your front door and you'll see what does well. Um, but it's less work when you match the plants to the soil. Um, nutrient deficiencies, um, it's interesting. There's a wonderful site that you can look up online called the Garden Professor's Blog. And uh, you can get, um, it's not this intervenal chlorosis, we call it iron deficiency. It's interesting when the soil is very acidic or acidic, um, then you get a release of phosphorus and that actually plugs up the receptors in the plant so it can't take up uh, iron and manganese. Although we don't have an issue with manganese here anyway. If you're stewarding your home soil properly, you're not going to have nutrient deficiencies. Uh, and if you're matching the plants to the soil type, don't plant things that love acid soil in local clay. They're not going to love that. Um, so choosing plants, plant the right plant in the right place. Uh, this is marsh marigold. It's beautiful in, in rain gardens. It uh, actually comes up in the spring, blooms, and then dies back down. Um, plant plants that like the shade in the shade. Don't try and fight. You, you put ostrich fern, it may look lovely for two months and then summer gets here and then it's going to get all burnt. So plant plants in the right place. Um, look at nitrogen fixers. So if you're doing veggie gardening, then you might want to look at planting peas and beans, move them around every year so that you don't get problems building up in the soil. For your lawn, you can look at clover. Um, they're uh, lovely in the lawn and they're great for pollinators as well. There, are, This is a plant called sweet fern. Common names are so confusing, not a fern, uh, actually a shrub. But it works with a fungus. These guys work with bacteria to take nitrogen under the air and fix it for the plants, hold it, make it available. This works with a fungus to take nitrogen out of the air and make it available to the plants around it. And it's a beautiful little shrub. Um, and so do honey locusts. Honey locusts play well with others because they have a dappled shade, but they're nitrogen fixers. So they fertilize not only themselves, but all the other plants around them. Um, companion planting. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Jessica Walliser about companion plants. Um, just look up Jessica Walliser uh, or Savvy Gardening. Actually, they do some amazing work. That's Jessica's part of that with uh, Nikki Jabour and Tara Nolan. Um, and uh, she has a science based book on companion plants, which is fantastic. Um, marigolds, for instance, release a chemical, I believe, called alpha tocopherol, and it uh, retards the growth of virus in the soil. Um, uh, nasturtiums will retard the growth of nematodes, and there are bad nematodes and good nematodes. Um, really, again, it's about every tool in the toolbox, using a variety of plants. So many landscapes out there are boxwoods and hydrangeas, and we can do so much more than that if you have variety in your landscape. Variety equals resilience. Um, this is an amazing plant called um, uh, Chenopodium, or lamb's quarters. There are tons of different species. Uh, this can take salt out of the soil and sequester it. So you clean that off and, and send it to the composting because it'll be diluted there. Um, it could actually bioremediate nuclear waste. Plants are amazing at cleaning the soil uh, and even breaking up the soil. I have tillage radishes uh, that I will plant in a new bed and they drill down through the soil, open up holes in the soil. And then when they die at the end of the year, then those holes become infiltration zones uh, for water, which is brilliant. Um, Cattails uh, are being used in, in certain sewage plants, uh, believe it or not, to clean the water. They're brilliant at, at cleaning water. Uh, we're doing new cool things now. Uh, these are called silva cells. And one of the reasons that trees have problems in the urban landscape is because engineers rightly demand a certain level of compaction before you build on top of that. Well, that level of compaction means that the tree roots can't get into it. So what we're doing is digging these big trenches, putting in these uh, silva cells, these big blocks 
filling it with topsoil and then planting the trees there so that the tree roots can go down, but you've got a hard surface on top that you can build interlocker pathways and so on on. So we are learning, we are doing things, we're, we're actually improving a uh, little bit by little bit. We're learning about things like structural soils. Um, so these are gravel that have soil mixed in with them. The plant roots can still move through, but you can compact it. Um, we're doing studies to find out how well trees grow in structural soils. Uh, so we're, we're actually, frankly, quite surprised at how well trees do. You look at that uh, massive tree root system that's there. Um, very healthy, very happy. Um, there are ways around challenges, but frankly, we have to spend the money up front. But when we do that, we we get our investment back on the back end because trees add value to our communities. But you've got to have good soil to grow good trees. That's that's the trick of it. And we've got to think whenever we're thinking about plants, we got to think from the ground up, literally. Um, look at that tree root system uh, that that's on that plant. In fact, they could probably have gone ahead and I mean, this was a scientific experiment, but look at the roots on that. I bet they could have replanted that and it would have done well. <laughs> I always get a kick out of it when, when people say, oh, take the rocks out of the hole when you're planting that tree. What, trees don't encounter rocks in the wild? Look over those wild rocks. Plants are really good at adapting to the world around them. Really, really good. Uh, and, and they'll just encompass rocks right into the tree roots. It's interesting that this has mycorrhizal uh, visible in it. Um, <laughs> I, I I don't know. I get a kick out of things like this. There's these massive rocks that are uh, just part of a tree's root system eventually. So, um, and then you get into neat little things. Um, this is uh, something called hugel culture, and hugel culture is pretty cool. Um, we um, well, there's two ways to do it. You can dig a big hole and and fill it up with logs and sticks and stuff um, and then you put the earth that you dug out of the hole back on top in this case they've just basically built a wall of sticks and then covered it over with soil the idea being that each of those sticks as they begin to rot becomes a condominium for all of the creatures that might live in the soil so you get the population going way up and then they radiate out into the soil doing good things for us uh hugel culture is is a pretty neat idea um there's not a lot of studies done on how effective it is yet but it's it's really uh taking leaps from leaps forward uh if you want to learn more about that um there well there's all sorts of things you can find online but the rodale uh, institute is doing some neat research on everything organic and soil now um it's also a good way to get rid of fallen brush and logs i, I i'm a fan of uh the concept of the refugia pile. So instead of bundling up all your sticks and sending them away for grinding and composting, find some shrubs, tuck a pile of sticks behind that, and then all of the things like ground beetles that we talked about and rove beetles, uh, they're going to be able to live in there and then radiate out. We actually uh, we had a refugia pile for about five years in my old place, um, and and we actually had shrews. Shrews look like little mice but they're voracious feeders. Pound for pound, they're the most voracious creature on the planet. Um, they, uh, they eat way more than their body weight a day in, in pests. So having all these things living in your property, some of you aren't gonna love this, but even snakes are really good for the garden. Snakes eat slugs, believe it or not. Um, they eat, they'll, a garter snake will eat a lot of slugs out of your garden and keep that under control. So even if you don't like them, I, for instance, do not love spiders. Talk about being in the wrong business, being a landscaper and not loving spiders. But I've, we've, we've learned to keep our peace with each other unless they don't run directly at me. <laughs> uh, but, you know, these things are good for our garden. Everything is good for our garden. Uh, sidebar, I love a bird called the house wren. Some citizen scientists set up a, a, a camera. So every time the bird landed on the perch, the camera would take a picture of the bird. And at the end of the year, he went through with a magnifying glass and looked at what was in the beak. And it was half their diet is spiders. So I like house wrens. Um, uh, the, according to National Geographic, we farm 40% of the, uh, the Earth's surface. It has been argued that Rome fell because of over farming. Absolutely, Asia uh, could have taken over the world. 10,000 years ago and stayed that way, but they over farmed their soil and that soil ran off into the oceans. The city of Basra in um, Iraq 
that bit of land that it's on used to be 80 miles out into the ocean. That's how much earth ran off into the Red Sea because of over farming, uh, because of not stewarding the soil properly. And soil is valuable to us. And we need to look after it. Uh, you can't just, well, you can, you can't just pour fertilizer on the ground and make crops. You can, but what you get is, is like in, in Idaho, you get potatoes that are just starch. We're making the potato make potatoes by over fertilizing. Um, if we stewarded the soil better, you have better nutrition density. So I'm a big fan of growing your own food and I'm a big fan of community gardens and so on. Uh, and even organic food, because there's a whole mindset that goes with it that sort of tugs along the idea of soil stewardship. Uh, why get rid of organic matter when you can uh, reuse it in the soil and then you have better nutrition density. So this one pound of carrots actually has more nutrition than a pound of factory farmed carrots. Big egg is not real good at stewarding the soil, which is why when we talk about improving the soil, we talk about focusing on small farmers and home gardeners. Um, the amazing thing is that, that and, and this just blows me away, if we could do this, if we could get small farmers to do this, we could turn around climate change in, in five years because it's not just about the plant roots. That's a thing. Prairie soil and the prairie ecology can sequester more carbon than a rainforest because the rainforest soil is not very good, whereas the you've got giant trees sequestering carbon, but in a prairie, you have all the plants, all the roots, very fine roots that go deep, deep into the soil. Plus you've got all of the fungi and bacteria and viruses are a carbon-based life form. And even something called archaea, um, which is a little microscopic creature, close, more clo we're more closely related to fungi than we are to bacteria. We're more closely related to archaea than we are to fungi. So it's interesting. And archaea is the stuff that, breaks down organic matter when there isn't enough oxygen around. They're also, you know them as extremophiles, the things that live on fumaroles under the ocean and on geysers and so on. But if we could get people to cut back on tilling the soil, don't cultivate the soil. Unless you're weeding or planting a new plant, you don't need to cultivate the soil. Um, work on mulching and nutrient recycling. I'm trying to get people not to use triple mix topsoil. Use screen topsoil and then institute uh, a philosophy on your property whereby what falls on your property stays on your property. If your neighbor's putting out leaves to send them away, grab them and mulch them up and put them on your garden. The more organic matter you can add, I'm sure to a certain degree, but the more you can add, the better. And then you will be sequestering carbon, making healthier, happier plants. If you're growing your own food, you're making plants that are better for you um, because there's more nutrient density and you're supporting all the things that live in the soil as well all that soil microbiome so that i mean that's pretty amazing stuff when you get into it i've always got to get my dig in about not using invasive species uh look up the grow me instead guide uh if you look up grow me instead ontario you'll find the grow me instead guide it's very canadian we don't tell people what to do or not to do we say here's a plant that harms the environment and we'd rather you didn't grow it but here's a whole bunch of better plants that aren't gonna harm the environment. So this is Norway maple, very tough to garden under, um, cast very dense shade and drought, and the seedlings move into the wild and push out our native species and all the things that feed on them, cascades up the troughs, the food levels. Uh, this is ruby lace honey locust. What a beautiful tree. It casts a dappled shade. It's easy to garden under. It, uh, captures nitrogen from the air and makes it available to, for, to the plants around it. It's super drought tolerant. They're actually even looking at honey locust as a way to uh, more, ah, just a different way to make uh, sugar. Like maple syrup, you can make honey locust syrup. I just found this out myself. Um, so anyway, uh, I love questions. Um, people can reach me on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. They can email me. Um, they can reach me through my webpage. Uh, there are all kinds of different ways to reach me. I've got a YouTube page that you can subscribe to. So cheesy, but it's important. <laughs> um, so feel free to reach out anytime. People play What's This Plant? What's This Bug? with me all the time. 
Um, I love questions. If I know the answer, it makes me feel good. And if I don't know the answer, it makes me learn something, which makes me feel good. I'm a big fan of collecting experts. Uh, I mentioned the Master Gardeners of Ontario Facebook page. Um, Savvy Gardening uh, has great, great information on it. Um, when you're doing searches, tack on .edu and .org on the end, and you'll get more educational information, not just somebody trying to sell you something. Um, so anyway, having said all that, um, perhaps we can uh, take some questions. Thank you for your attention on this level of things.